What's going on guys? So we are out here at Lippert's Worldwide Global Headquarters. I like to say that to make it sound like super, super big and important because it is. This is where they showcase and feature a lot of innovation, a lot of even prototype products that may be coming to market, may never come to market, but are kind of design concepts for future iterations of something. But ultimately, this is a great place to visit if you really want to see what Lippert's capable of doing and some of the technology and some of the other companies that they've, they own and that they partner partner with and that they work with. So really, really cool to be out here today. We're going to take a look at what you're looking at in front of you today. This is super cool. This is what they consider to be kind of the first iteration of the Kurt Helix front suspension pin box. This is really cool. Hang tight. I'll be right back. So I got my buddy Tim back. How are you doing today, man? Doing great, how are you? I'm doing really good. And I got my good friend Andrew back here as well. So Andrew is Vice President of Sales. So he's the one that isn't out selling to you, the individual retail consumer. He's the one that, well, you, you manage the whole team of people who sell stuff essentially, right? On the OEM side. On the OEM side. And when they say OEM, OEM means the RV manufacturing side. So it's him and his team that try to get RV manufacturers to take advantage of the innovation, the new products that are being built here and to apply it to their units. Right. While at the same time, also understanding that RV manufacturers are very cost conscious and they want to be able to maybe do something special in one area, but save cost in another area. That's why you all produce products with several different variations sometimes. You have good, better, best, and extraordinarily best. You have all sorts of different product lineups to address that, right? Correct, yeah, I'd say at the, very, the bare minimum, we try to have a good, better, best to hit not only the different segments of the market, but also to hit, to JD's point, of the different expectation of what the customer's looking for for that specific product. Um, but at good, better, best is worst case, and then in some instances, we have good, better, best, best, better, better, you know, up to 10 variations of the same, of the same product. Yep. And this is really important because RV manufacturers, for the most part, want to build a product that people want to buy. And if the industry is saying, hey, you know what, we need to put Goodyear Endurance tires on our RV, but because of that, we need to shave some cost perhaps in another area. We need to go to a slightly less expensive part in another area. By having that good, better, best offering, it gives you the ability to allow a manufacturer to focus where they need to put their budget this year and save some cost perhaps in another area, right? Correct, yeah, and, and, and guys to have different stories, different strategies for their product too, right? So to the point, a guy who wants to focus on towing is gonna talk about a lot of what we're talking about here. You know, it's a pin box, it's a new running gear, you know, it's something with the chassis. And then there's other guys who wanna put a story around the appliances or really wanna focus on the inside. They may spend a little bit less there, but then maybe mm -hmm. put in a higher grade appliance or furniture package or, you know, anything else on the interior of the coach. Yep, and if you take a second when you're walking an RV lot, you can almost instantly tell where they're trying to put that that attention. Like our pod with the beast mode suspension, which is essentially the Kurt independent suspension, right? That's obviously an area where they want people to see that we're investing in the suspension aspect. But then you look at perhaps the Lance might have a bit more of a traditional suspension, but they're putting perhaps the highest quality door in, or they might be putting a different window in or a different piece of appliance on the inside. So it really, again, just depends on what you're looking for as a consumer and what the manufacturer's trying to do. Very important topic because you, you look at Lance, I consider it to be a very high quality product. And again, where they focus some of their, their, their efforts are different than where our pod, also a high quality product, focuses their attention in two different ways. Yep. So very cool. Yeah, exactly. But anyways, we have a really, really cool product in front of us today. Okay, so Tim, let's talk about Helix. Now, big disclaimer, huge disclaimer. This was kind of like the original concept prototype of the Helix, correct? Correct. This is not the go-to-market, what you will see on RV version of the Helix. But it's really cool to still understand this concept. Do you want to go over the mentality behind this product? Yeah, so this is the first one that we built. The goal being to, to allow that vertical movement and shock absorption and, and prevent that impact loading from making it up into your fifth wheel trailer uh, without having to use air, uh, which requires you to maintain the air level correctly. Okay, I love the fact that you have this big coil spring right here. I see the rating on the coil spring as well. Um, are you going with different ratings for different pin boxes? Correct, different different sizes for different different capacities. Okay, 
And the final iteration of this, which is actually in a video that we have shot or will either shoot, what I mean by that is we already shot it, but I don't know if that video is gonna come out before or after this video, is a little different. So you're gonna have to watch that video to see what changes were made. And ultimately, the reason why you have iterations and changes is because something seems good and it may perform exceptionally well, but then once you start subjecting it to that cycle testing and just really going through it, you might say, we need to tweak it. We need to do something a little different to perform um, to perform in a way that meets the standards that we expect, right? Correct. This was very early in the prototyping process and we hadn't done any of our validation testing. And so once we got into the validation stage, uh, we realized that there were some issues with, with this and so we made some design changes and what we've got today is phenomenal pit box. Yep, and what's what's cool about what he said is when you say we there were some issues, that is with engineering in general. Automotive engineering, that's with aircraft, everything. There's always going to be a step process of this is what the original concept was and this is all the generations in between to get it to where it finally can be a product that you can purchase. Cor correct. That's why we have a robust de design validation plan uh, and, and we follow it for our, all of our products. Now, when I look at this, there's one thing that is similar between this and the, the actual go-to-market version that I saw, um, and that is the, the skeletal structure of the entire thing, what it actually looks like. What's the overall weight going to be, probably, of the, of the aftermarket pin box if somebody wants to add it to their RV? They're 125 or 130 pounds. That's um, not it, terribly bad. It, it's not, and, and that's the weight of the box. You aren't going to add that much because the box that you're taking out obviously has some weight yep. as well. With this one, you still need a fifth wheel hitch, but you're going to have a gooseneck version of this as well. Correct. The gooseneck version, I imagine, will probably weigh a little bit more, it right? Does. There's yes. more mass. Yep. But if you're removing a 200 pound gooseneck or fifth wheel hitch from the bed of your truck, yeah. and you're removing a 70 pound OEM pin box, you're still going to kind of be positive. It won't reduce the pin weight, but it will reduce the weight in the truck. In the so. bed of the truck, is, yeah. yeah the overall weight correct. pressing down correct. on the truck. So that is really, really cool. I can't wait to see the final version of it go to market. That is super cool. And again, in another video, we actually show you the final version of it. And there are some significant changes to it. And those changes were all to allow it to withstand the torture that they're subjected to being pulled down US highways. Yeah, right? definitely check out that video. Okay, so next, he wanted to go over their new leveling system. So if you've shopped RVs or fifth wheels, you know that there's typically two flavors of auto leveling. You have hydraulic and you have electric. Now, I'm kind of a fan of both, but for different reasons. I love the serviceability of electric. The ability just to basically rip a jack out, put a new motor on, or, and you're good to go. Yeah. Whereas hydraulic, it's a little bit more to it. You have some serviceability baked into it, but it's not as easy for an RV park side repair quickly if you have a hydraulic related issue. Okay, so of all the RVs that I've filmed, um, typically the way I identify electronic versus hydraulic is the square tube legs. If you have square tube legs, you're typically gonna have the ground control system, but when you have the round tube legs up front, you're gonna have the hydraulic level up system. Now, from my experience, the hydraulic system tends to be more powerful. I, I mean, people actually do crazy things with it, like lift their entire RV off the ground to change tires. I don't know if you recommend doing that, but people do that. Um, the electronic system is significantly slower, and I know that you definitely don't want to try to lift your RV off the ground in any way with either of them, but the electronic systems I don't think physically can for the most part. They're really just designed to level out your RV, right? It's it's a system designed for fifth wheels, but with the understanding that it's not gonna be as powerful as a hydraulic system. They're, they're designed to level the RV, correct? And they're not designed for using the, to change tires, for sure. Okay. So this is our new Titan hydraulic leveling system. We've uh, redesigned the leg to add some extra features. We've got some lights so that you can see where your foot pads are. We've reduced the number of fasteners that you need to attach it to the chassis. And we've streamlined the shape of it to make it a little more uniform, which is actually easier from a manufacturing process. Very cool. So we yeah. really tried to think outside of the box and, uh, and innovate the shape. It was something completely different that no one's ever done. It is totally different. Yeah, they, they look completely different. The, the pads on the ground look completely different. That is very cool. So that is absolutely awesome. Another great innovation. But there's one that, that draws my eye to it over here, and I really want to see this. So this is definitely more of a prototype or more of a concept, correct? But what was the idea behind this concept? And what are some of the limitations some folks may have if this goes to market on certain RV frames? So the goal with this concept was to get the step out of the entry door and 
get it underneath the frame. And the reason for that is when it's in the entry door, you're limited by the size of the door. And so by moving it underneath the chassis, we were able to make the step significantly wider than the than the doorway is, and that allows you to have a nice resting oh, place yeah. at the top of the at the top of the stairs. You know, my wife would absolutely love this because the challenge you have when you walk upstairs, you mind if I walk up them? No, go ahead. Is you get to the step on traditional stairs, you have to open up the door, step down, and then you climb in the RV to close the door. But with something like this, it gives you this great landing at the top to give you the room to essentially stand next to your door, open it up, and just enter. And that is a brilliant, brilliant idea. But then I look at this, and I look at the floor plan of our Brookstone, where the entry exit door is almost over the tire right here, and I think this wouldn't be compatible with our Brookstone, especially considering where the drop frame is. Correct. And so when we got the prototype built and we installed it on here, we've shown it to a lot of people and there's a lot of interest in it, but there's some design challenges and you hit on one of the biggest, which is working around the floor plan. You've got tank terminations to work around. You've got door, where the entry door is, the suspension. Uh, there's, there's just a, a more challenges than we originally anticipated. So I'm guessing my theory would be is when you're working with an RV manufacturer, and they see something like this, they would really have to say, okay, I want to put this or I want to be able to use this with the specific floor plan we're building. So they're building the floor plan around being able to offer this as a solution. Correct. When you're designing an RV, there's a lot of different things that you're trying to fit into a certain amount of space. And so it takes a tremendous amount of engineering work to, to successfully accomplish that. And this adds another level of complexity to that. So. Anytime I see something that's built like this, and this looks super robust, just the entire thing, it's all aluminum from what I can tell as well, at least for the most part. Looks like you're using like a urethane type of a, a bushing right there to prevent it, or a guide to prevent it from marring or damaging, kind of a self-lubricating feature, I'm guessing. Yeah, it's a plastic slide, self-lubricating. Self so I think, man, this looks expensive. I really do. And typically my mind... I'm gonna throw a number out, and I know that you guys aren't selling this yet, but my number would be like fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars. Am I am I high, low, or where am I at? I would hate to even guess. I'm the engineering guy. Okay. But yeah, this this to me, again, it looks expensive, but it looks like something a lot of people would absolutely love to have on their RV. Um, I know my wife would love to have it. Does it operate? Can you can you actually close it? I'd love to see how this works. Is it hydraulically assisted or or does it not need to be? That is super cool. And it comes out just as easy. Man, this is cool. I want this on the back of my pickup truck. That is awesome. Anyways, I love it. Leave a comment below. Is this a product that you want to come to market? Knowing that most aftermarket high quality steps are like $500, $600. What do you think a good price for something like this might be? And now, you know, this is going to be a video they can watch so that they can at least understand and get an idea of what people are willing to pay if an RV manufacturer could integrate this into their RV or even in, in an aftermarket sense if you have the space on your frame for it. That is really, really cool. What else you got to show me? Any, any other innovative solutions? So to wrap up that video, I wanted to come over here real quick and show you the suspension on this cool little travel trailer. And this is essentially that independent suspension system that you've probably seen in a lot of my videos. You've seen it on Ember, you've seen it on RPOD. But this is a really cool system and it's definitely kind of a testimony to the fact that they are innovating and they're really trying to do things that are kind of profoundly different than what you're used to. So this is really cool. It is a very, very good quality system, even though it is rather heavy. So when you add the system to an RV, again, because of all the bracing and structure, it's totally gonna add some additional weight to the RV itself.